In the latest episode of Steel Talks, Philippe Oberon, head of Global Automotive, offers exclusive insights into the company's history in the automotive sector and what it takes to remain the global leader in automotive steels. He explores key industry trends and highlights ArcelorMittal's innovative products and solutions that are shaping steel's role as the material of choice for both the automotive industry and the EV revolution. Hello, Philippe. Uh, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for joining me. Hello, Tom. I'm very happy to be with you today. We're here talking about the automotive industry, and, and to the uninitiated, it might be quite a surprise just how deeply integrated a steel company is into the car making process. Because you might think from the outside, well, you provide them with sheets of steel. They stamp them into car bodies, and, and that's the, the limit of your involvement. But it, it's not quite that simple, is it? You are correct. Our involvement goes way beyond supplying a product to our customers. We started 40 years ago, and we found a good match between the automotive business, which is a very demanding industry, and our ambition to create more value by differentiating ourselves. And since we have faced many, many challenges, decades ago, car makers were facing corrosion issues. Vintage car lovers know that the car can rest, but it's no longer an issue because we have developed for our customer new coatings to protect steel from rust. And later on, we have played a key role in enhancing vehicle crash performance. We developed many high-strength steel products. The, to the toughest one, sorry, is very formidable and is five times stronger than the steel they were used 25 years ago. And the progress made over the last two decades is remarkable. You can find numerous videos on YouTube showcasing how crash behavior has evolved. And then later on, we went further on products and steel solutions to cut the tailpipe emissions, the CO2 emissions from the car. And now, today, we are working to reduce the overall footprint of cars. So it's been a very exciting journey. It has also been incredibly rewarding as it challenges us to go further, improve continuously, think differently, and more important, develop new concepts. And what's also been great is that it has fostered personal growth, which is truly gratifying. So talk to me a bit more in depth then about that, that conversation, that interaction with automakers. You, know, you mentioned you know, corrosion resistance there, corrosion being a problem. What happens? Is they, do they come to you and say, you know, our cars are rotting away too quickly. What can you do about it? And then you get involved in, in metallurgy. What happens in that conversation? Well, actually, it's all about anticipating the problem, of course. We don't, okay. the car makers, they don't wait that they have a rest issue to come to us. And we <laughs> anticipate also the needs because as metallurgists, we know how to build on new coatings, more resistant coating to corrosion, and we promote them to the car makers. And it's really a dialogue. So we talked about this corrosion resistance. You mentioned safety, you mentioned weight saving. What have been some of the more recent sort of anticipations you've had of the demands of the car industry? Because obviously it keeps evolving. You know, I know that there have been particular challenges that you've brought or rather solutions challenges that you've brought to the market more recently, which I think in some ways it embeds you even further into the car making process. We are like for 30 years, a very strong collaboration with car makers. So we've developed high strength steel, super strong steel with still some elongation to be able to form them in complex shape. And the most recent development is that we want to make our customer life easier. Also to provide consistent quality to, to our customers. And we have developed what we call the multi-part integration. Basically, we do a little bit what the customer used to do but we integrate some parts. Can you give me a, a practical example of how that sort of production process, that technology hits that objective of simplification and perhaps cost saving as well for the manufacturers? So I, I take a concrete example, the body side of the car that we call the door ring is to put together a different piece of steel. And basically we take 14 parts into one for the door ring. So it reduced complexity. So we weld together different blanks, different piece of shit of different strength, of different thickness to basically customize to the customer need in terms of crush resistance. 
reduce complexity, it simplifies the process for the car makers, and for us, we provide high added value product. Before you would have been sending them 14 different pieces of steel that yeah. they would have had to weld together, and now it rocks up as a single piece. Right. Basically, they had to not only to take 14 different blanks, different pieces, they would have to take the coil, cut the blanks, stem the blanks, weld the blanks. Today, we provide them one single blanks. They just have to stamp it. So it's a much simpler process, faster, cheaper. And on top of that, we have the consistency of the assembly quality. So in terms of crash worthiness, it's also an additional guarantee that we provide to the car maker. So you're actually taking on sort of some of the manufacturing for them to, to make their lives a bit easier. And then those multi-parts, what I find really interesting about them is, as you say, they're not just sort of one sort of steel. It's not just like a blank. It's got different strengths, different categories of steel in there to provide particular functions. Is that right? That's absolutely correct. It's like a patchwork of steel pieces. So instead of dealing with tens of parts, it's just dealing with one major part because we have done their job already. And it provides better safety, uh, lighter, lighter weight vehicles. And what role do, do electrical steels play in that, in that sort of supply chain for the, for the car makers? So electrical steel, so now we're moving to electrification. Mm. So we know the, the, the Chinese have the, has, have the lead, the Europe is, is catching up. And for us, it's crucial to be a steel and steel solution provider to the car industry. They are looking for a very efficient electrical engine to improve the range, to reduce the consumption. And what we are, do we are doing, we are building facilities all over the world to provide to the car makers the electrical steel they need to build these, those electrical engines that needs to be super efficient to provide to the end user the maximum range possible. You mentioned all over the world, and I think that's a really critical point here because we, you know, we are in the in the middle of this sort of EV transition, and that's obviously having an effect on your role, but actually it's changing the the whole sort of car market as well. It's created a much more of a sort of entry point for for new manufacturers, for new brands. What differences are you seeing globally with that sort of global perspective between Europe, the US and China in that transition? Because I know you and I have both been to China in the last year, have been really shocked by what we saw. A few years ago, knowledge was very much flowing one way in the car industry. And you know, from the established automakers with their processes, the learning of, of decades, to China and in some ways it feels like the knowledge is now starting to flow back the other way. 15 years ago people were having fun of what the, the product they were providing. Uh, nobody's laughing anymore. They, they build amazing cars, great looking cars. Uh, I think you saw the same in Shanghai, it was uh, puzzling. And now but the technology on the battery and the engine also they're extremely strong. So now actually the legacy car makers are building partnership with the Chinese just to understand oh, how do they do to, to, to develop cars so fast. And so it's a lesson of kind of a humility for the legacy car makers, but also for us, you need to rethink the process. And if you cannot compete, if you cannot develop the car as fast as they do, you will be out of the game soon. That sort of knowledge must be particularly valuable to some of the the older automakers now given the challenges that they're facing certainly the mood i was at the the, the financial times future of the car event not long ago and it wasn't an overly positive mood from a lot of the manufacturers yeah. they, they must be really looking for and hungry for ways that they can advance save money improve profitability at the moment the, the, the mood is not that great because it, we are facing very challenging times uh, you see high pace of development in China with electrification. Roughly 50% of the car today produce our EVs. In Europe, it's speeds up, but you know they have to catch up. And we know that the customer there, especially in China, they're looking for innovative products. So the beauty of China is that as soon as you develop something new, they are willing to try it. And it's, it's, it's great. So even our Chinese team, you can feel the enthusiasm, the energy. That is great. 
You mentioned electrical steels there, and clearly as part of the, the sort of EV transition, there's very rapid innovation going on in terms of the efficiency, the power of motors. We're seeing some just shrinking and power outputs going up. You know, we talked about the conversation between ArcelorMittal and the the automakers in terms of the body in white. What do those conversations look like in terms of electrical steels? What do they come? What what challenges are they bringing to you? So the challenges is that basically they want lighter engines, electrical engines that use more efficient electrical steel. What what does it mean? More efficient electrical steel. They want lower losses. Because in electrical engine, you have electrical losses, and the more losses you have, the less efficient the engine. The steel component of the electrical engine is very important. You have, as for the body in white, different quality level, super low loss versus higher losses. Of course, the price is different. You have different thickness. The thinner you get, the more efficient you are. But then you will need to find some compromise between the manufacturing manufacturability of the steel versus the performance so it's all about compromise it's a very complex equation to solve but we have basically the same kind of interaction with the car makers and the subcontractors on electrical steel that we had on the body in white we keep on working on body in white but the new area of focus is electrical steel and we have one facility in france we are building another one a bigger one, most, much more advanced one. We have one coming in the US and later on in China. Because we are a global partner of the automotive industry, we not only want to provide only the grades for the steel skeleton of the car, but also for the electrical engine. And it's for us a key component of our strategy. You mentioned this sort of this series of evolving challenges that the the current use face and you've helped them respond to. We talked about corrosion, we talked about um, safety, we talked about you know, light weighting, uh, electrification. Where do you see the next challenges being? Safety remains because passive safety remains a concern, even if they are working on you know, uh, active, uh, active safety with, uh, to avoid crashes. But when the crash happens, unfortunately it happens, even with the most sophisticated software, then you're very happy when you have a strong passive uh, protection. And in China, especially, there is a strong focus uh, because there, there were some accidents with some high-end uh, cars. And uh, so the government is really putting a lot of focus on the safety. So I would say the crash resistance of the, of the, of the steel skeleton of the car is of uh, prime importance. And then for us, the next cha the challenge, and we are already proposing solution. I mentioned the multi-part integration, the patchwork of different grades, is simplification of the process. And the motivation can be very different. It's also it's to cut cost. It was the case of one US car maker, Tesla, uh, who proposed the unbox process. So basically, it's like to to build to put together big pieces, make a car in three pieces, something like that, as so simple as that. Uh, but it's also, there are also consideration. And here we've heard from some Japanese car makers, famous ones, that because of the aging of population, they're looking to outsource more and more their operation. So for her, the interest beyond cost saving and weight saving is to get big parts that they get put together. But the prime motivation is that they're afraid to, to be very much challenged to find the right workforce in the future because of the population aging. So that's specific to Japan, but it's a reality. And that's some other, in some other region, other legacy car makers might face in the near future. It's amazing how those sort of cultural and demographic issues can drive changes in the car making process. Yeah, you, 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 don't, you think about technology, you think about safety, but you don't think about sort of shifts in the population being being so fundamental. Just going back to ArcelorMittal's history in the automotive industry, I think it's worth reinforcing just how prominent you are as a supplier because it, it's a, you mentioned the long history, but it's the, the sort of the scale of significance, particularly in certain parts of the world, is 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 very very strong. Is that right? That, that's right. The steel used today in the car body are five times stronger than they used to be 30 years ago. And we developed what we call the usable product in the 2000s. 
and it's still it's like up to 40 percent of the body in white weight today it's a huge massive success it's like the iphone of arcelormittal i would say <laughs> it's a it's a big big success because it's five times stronger than conventional steel it remains super light because you are use less steel thinner thinner steel because it's so strong so that's one of the key innovation we have brought to to the industry but is the result of more than 40 years of commitment, huge R&D spending, and yet success is there. One of, one of two cars in Europe are made with ArcelorMittal steel. So we have a big presence, not only in Europe, but also in the US, where we have facilities in China, South Africa, many different places. India is, of course, is the next territory, of course, and we are investing heavily in India because we are a strong believer in the, in the growth of the Indian market, especially in automotive. What do you think is coming next? I mean, it, I think it's clearly we're seeing a lot of discussion about changes in battery technology, um, increasing range, more structural capability, faster charging. What impact does that have on the parts that you're directly affecting? Not so much the motors necessarily, but the body in white. You know, where do you see that changing in the next few years? So for the for the body in white, the, the, the architecture of the EVs, so basically you need to protect the battery, it's, it's key. You have different design where the battery box is the major protector of the battery. Sometimes the body in white is the major contributor to the safety, to the crash resistance of the car. So you have different design and it's not specific to one car makers. So you have different philosophy and we need to adapt to it. And that's where being a global player, understanding the logic of different car makers all over the world help us to think about new solutions. When you are a local player only focusing on a group of, uh, of customers, you might not think about all this. So basically the beauty of operating in China, uh, having engineers in Japan close to the Japanese car maker and supplying all car makers all over the world gives us a broad range of uh, possibilities of challenges and uh, we need to think out of the box uh, basically again for us the worst would be to be complacent because of our position in the market today we believe we are well positioned because of a wide range of products so basically we can answer any specific needs of the customer we are not only working on products but also on steel solution and again for the is over the last 30 years that's what we have been doing is that anticipating customer need, not just waiting for them to ask for something, but getting a better understanding of the industry, anticipating needs, and provide product and still solution to them. Thanks, Philippe. That's a great place to wrap things up. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Mm-hmm.